Ladies and gentlemen, Bahamians everywhere, good afternoon. Early on in the government's response to the COVID-19 outbreak, I noted that the country had to respond on several fronts at the same time. We had to respond to the immediate and ongoing health challenges posed by the COVID virus. We also had to respond to the variety of economic challenges at home because of the massive and sudden global downturn, especially in our case, tourism, our leading economic sector. Many weeks ago, I appointed an economic recovery committee that is hard at work and will make medium and long-term recommendations to the government for economic stabilization and recovery. We also knew there would be a critical need for food. The National Food Distribution Committee has begun its work and has already distributed approximately $400,000 worth of food. I also previously noted that we also had to protect national security, including preventing as much crime as possible and the monitoring of gang activity and certain criminal elements. In making our decisions, we had to take into account many factors and to balance the various factors in a phased reopening of the economy and our society. After we prepared the National Reopening Plan, we noted that the plan would be done in stages so we could carefully monitor the progress. Most countries have opened in stages and announced that certain restrictions might be reimposed depending on the health circumstances. The situation the world is in is not static. It is dynamic, evolving process for an unprecedented time. And because of this, the Bahamas and other countries have had to continue to make often quick adjustments and to be prepared to change whenever it becomes necessary. The capacity to act and to change quickly is absolutely necessary, especially when dealing with an outbreak such as this. Such capacity to make changes quickly and when necessary is a strength. Just as we acted quickly at the outset of the pandemic, we have sought to act and to adjust quickly as things evolve. In countries such as South Korea, Vietnam, Iceland, and throughout the Caribbean, governments have changed course when necessary, made adjustments, and tried new measures in dealing with the health, economic, and social consequences of this deadly virus. Ladies and gentlemen, we are still in a global pandemic. There is no vaccine, nor there is any cure for this COVID-19. The success of the reopening depends on each of us continuing to wear our mask, practicing physical distancing, and washing our hands often and thoroughly. We have started to enter phase four of the reopening. Starting next weekend, 13th of June, the weekend lockdowns will be lifted. I repeat, starting next weekend, the 13th of June, the weekend lockdowns will be lifted. 
We have decided to maintain the 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew Monday to Sunday for a period of time. We are doing this in order to continue to open in a gradual and sustained manner. I wish to announce that effective Monday, June the 8th, beach and park restrictions will re be removed for the islands of Eleuthera, Harbor Island, Exuma, and San Salvador. Spanish Wells, which was hardly mentioned, is now completely free, and their beaches are likewise opened. Beaches and parks on New Providence, Paradise Island, Grand Bahama, and Bimini remains closed. Also effective Monday, the 8th of June, exercise is permitted from 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. beyond one's immediate neighborhood every day of the week. You may continue to exercise with your immediate family. However, group exercise and sporting activities and events are still restricted. All professional services and commercial activity may resume regular operating hours but must be closed by 7 p.m. daily. This does not include restaurants, bars, hair salons, barbers, cinemas, gyms, cultural and entertainment facilities, which are to remain closed. Places of worship may resume regular office hours. Fishing is allowed with more than two people in a vessel. Physical distancing and proper sanitization and hygiene measures are required and masks should be worn. Effective Friday, June 12th, restaurants may reopen with outdoor sitting only. There will be no indoor sitting allowed at this point. This includes restaurants at Araki Fish Fry and Portiski Dock. All restaurants must follow industry COVID-19 protocols and guidelines. Owners must ensure proper physical distancing. Effective Monday, June 15th, hair salons and barbershops may resume operations following certification by the Ministry of Health. All salons, spas, and parlors wishing to open should produce a current business license, engage in deep cleaning of their salon, and put procedures in place to maintain physical distancing, hand washing, and sanitizing and mask wearing to protect themselves and their clients. In conjunction with the Ministry of Health, all beauty professionals are required to attend an infection prevention and control course before returning to work. The course will be offered digitally through the Bahamian Cosmetology and Barbers Association faces of Beauty School of Cosmetology and Workforce Training Institute or the Early Access Training Center. Upon successful completion of the class, proprietors will receive a certificate which must be displayed in the salon where they work. Health protocols have been established for specific industries. General workplace protocols are continuing to be finalized and revised as necessary by the health team and the National COVID-19 Coordinating Committee. The national examinations, BJC and BGCSE, will commence on the 13th of July and more information 
concerning this commencement will be provided in Parliament during our budget debate by the Minister of Education, the Honorable Jeffrey Lloyd. I wish to announce that the government's quarantine facility will be disabled or decommissioned on Friday, June the 5th. That applies both to the government quarantine facility, both in New Providence and in Grand Bahama. Returning Bahamians and residents will no longer be required to quarantine on returning home, but will be monitored by the Ministry of Health Surveillance Unit and HubCap monitoring app if necessary. To date, the government has facilitated the return of close to 500 Bahamians and residents on Bahamas Air. There have been five flights thus far. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Health are working to arrange more flights as necessary. The government has approved $16 million for the National Food Distribution Program. And this will provide food for approximately 80,000 people for 12 weeks. Food is being distributed in zones across the country and New Providence through the Ministry of Social Services and NGO partners. Accountability mechanisms to ensure proper distribution of food is being done in conjunction with the University of the Bahamas. I wish to note that through the suggestions platform on opm.gov.bs, the Office of the Prime Minister has received more than 2,700 suggestions from Bahamians and residents throughout our Bahamas. A team from the Office of the Prime Minister and the Ministry of Tourism went through each submission and earmarked each for a specific public-private committee or government agency. And thus far, close to 2,000 suggestions have been forwarded on to the National COVID-19 Coordinating Committee, the Economic Recovery Committee, the Ministry of Health, and the Ministry of Agriculture and Marine Resources. I want to thank everyone who took time, who took the time and the effort to submit a suggestion. I want to thank all of those who offered positive and constructive advice and proposed solutions as well as ideas. I want to especially thank the National COVID Coordinating Committee, which has greatly aided the government with valuable recommendations and professional guidance on the reopening of our economy. The committee has also served ex exceptionally well as a link to the private sector and civil society to develop relevant and specific protocols for the operation of various commercial activities. The work of the National COVID Coordinating Committee is fast coming to an end as we move into the new normal of our economic and social operations. We owe them our gratitude. Let me end by reminding the public that the weekend lockdown goes into effect at 9 p.m. tonight. Our Labor Day tomorrow, June 5th. You may exercise in your immediate neighborhood 9 a.m., 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. Grocery stores may open 6 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. to the general public, and pharmacies may operate 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. Restaurants with takeaways and drive throughs may operate from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. 
Otherwise, you must stay at home unless you have an emergency, are an essential worker, or have been specifically exempted. Let me take this opportunity to thank the workers of the Bahamas. This is a very difficult Labor Day for many, including the many thousands of Bahamians who have lost their jobs or have been laid off. I assure you that one of our most urgent and overriding concerns is the creation of jobs and opportunities for work as we outlined in the recent budget communication by our Minister of Finance, the Honorable Peter Turnquist. Just like the rest of the world, COVID-19 has put us in the worst economic situation since independence. We are going to do everything in our power to get our economy moving as quickly as possible in the medium and the long term. I'm going to work every day, day after day, to restore as much of our economy as quickly as possible. I will have more to say about this in my budget communication, and I will brief the country on the work of the Economic Recovery Committee. Before I turn over to Dr. Dal Regis, who will give a, brief, a health briefing, I want to remind the roadside vendors that there are no roadside vendors allowed on the streets at this particular time. It is essential. This is essential as we continue to fight this COVID pandemic and to mitigate the situation that the world finds itself in. In order to be restored, special locations will be provided. Individuals must be certified, they must receive food handler certificate, and they must also be certified via sanitization. This is again in an effort to continue our fight and our combat against this COVID pandemic disease. I want to repeat that roadside vendors at this particular time, until properly advised, are not allowed on our streets or our sidewalks. As for those that embark on the sale of crab, they have been certified and they and specific locations are being provided for them so that they can sell their various crabs. I would now hand over to Dr. Dahl Regis, who would give us a press briefing. I thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you, Prime Minister. The latest update on COVID-19 in the Bahamas for this 23rd epidemiological week. We have a total number of cases of 102. Of that number, 80 are in New Providence, 8 in Grand Bahama, 13 in Bimini, and 1 in Cat Key. Pleased to let you know that there no new cases were reported today. The number of recovered cases is increasing, now 55. Af active cases are at 36. Deaths remain at, a, at 11, and hospitalized cases are at two. And we've done 2,142 deaths um, to date. During this period, uh, if you show the first slide, we would have had few confirmed cases with periods of no cases. The second slide shows you the cumulative number of cases and that horizontal uh, bar represents no new deaths from April 24th of this year. In Grand Bahama, the next grid please, there have been 29 days since the last confirmed case, 
of COVID-19 was reported on that island. In Bimini, it's been 21 days. Uh, a new Providence is playing catch up. We've made significant progress based on the number of new confirmed cases and no COVID-19 related deaths for five weeks. The number of cases admitted to hospital has, has decreased if you follow the graph. The number of ICU beds have decreased. And the, num and the length of hospital stay has also decreased. So we're making significant progress. And this has resulted in our next graph, which shows bending of the curve. The update from Bimini. Monday, the 1st of June at 5 a.m., Bimini completed two weeks of quarantine, and we are waiting the results of uh, the re-swabbing of 18 residents. The results are pending. This lockdown was implemented to assist in the containment and control of the community spread of COVID-19. And we've received no reports of new or suspect cases during the quarantine period. And we are truly optimistic that the lab results will show a large number of, of recovered cases. The Prime Minister has indicated the data on the 500 individuals who have returned on the five flights. They were tested beforehand, were negative. Uh, we've had no cases and no concerns about those who have returned. It is anticipated that, as you've heard, that we'd have more of these individuals returning. Part of our strategy was to use the Hubcat geometric fencing app. And we continue to enroll individuals who require quarantine verification using this app. And despite increasing uh, technology challenges, particularly with those over the age of 65, there continues to be a steady enrollment into the program. We've also received a number of boundary alerts for those who break quarantine. It is necessary to have heightened surveillance in all islands. We will do PCR testing for suspect cases of COVID-19, and we will test all contacts of confirmed cases. As we prepare to reopen uh, the government for commercial activity, we anticipate more testing to be required and the need for increased capacity uh, with surveillance to identify any possible COVID-19 cases. Effective the 8th of June, Persons traveling from New Providence uh, by aircraft, mail boat, or passenger ferry would be required to complete standardized travel and health forms at the check-in counter. This method of travel replaces the previously established inter-island travel process established on the 18th of May and implemented by the Ministry of Health. We really want to thank members of the public for their patience and cooperation as we continue to refine our travel processes. The Ministry of Health continues to monitor <clears throat> the effectiveness of the public health measures to prevent and control the spread throughout the Bahamas. The public health measures set in place to slow the pandemic in the Bahamas are working. For them to keep working, you must keep the following, keep up the following, keep up with, with the guidance. 
because the pandemic is not over. More than 330,000 people have died around the world from COVID-19. So we appeal to you to stay disciplined, stay physically distant as much as possible, continue to protect your elders, and in doing so, we can further progress through the opening up of phases and return to a greater sense of normalcy. Thank you. Good afternoon. May I invite Jerome Sawyer to ask his question? Yes, good afternoon. Um, my question, I, I guess it's directed to the Prime Minister, um, and good afternoon again. Uh, there seems to be a lot that will be happening over the next two weeks with the phased reopening as we move now into phase four, or the beginning of phase four as indicated, um, coinciding with the discontinuation of the COVID hotline and now the closing of the quarantine facility. A lot of businesses will be coming back on stream and a lot of movement. Uh, my question has to do uh, with what indicators will be put in place um, to alert health officials and the public should there be a resurgence in cases and what kind of enforcement is also being put in place to ensure that these businesses are abiding by the guidelines set out uh, in the Prime Minister's remarks just a few moments ago. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the monitoring, the surveillance, we have uh, our surveillance activities throughout the islands will increase. But we would change the uh, identification to identification of COVID positive cases. By that, the, uh, anyone reporting symptoms um, to any of our health facilities, they would undergo screening. And that screening would then lead to either you need a test or you don't need a test. We have the capacity now to do the testing. Um, if the test is positive, you would have to be placed in quarantine. For those arriving um, from abroad, the same would be required of them. We do have surveillance at the airport as well. And we have those linkages um, with the uh, at various sentinel sites at our clinics. So we would continue to evaluate the performance uh, of, uh, well, the surveillance performance over the over this period of time very closely. That's my question. Can you answer my question? Second part, second part of the question had to do with enforcement. Uh, what kinds of um, measures are being put in place to ensure that uh, these requirements are being enforced, particularly with businesses, um, even when we get to the point of uh, beauty shops and barbers opening, who, according to the Prime Minister, have to be um, certified and must receive the proper certification, and all these other um, requirements that are being put in place. What's being done in terms of enforcement to ensure that these things are happening? And then penalties are penalties going to be meted out for those who are not abiding by um, the regulations? Uh, let me say to you that um, public empowerment, the empowerment is going to help us a lot with the enforcement uh, of these measures. We will announce, hopefully, uh, to the public what, the, what they should expect. We ask the public to require it of the business uh, facilities. We ask each other to police the, what is going on uh, at all the commercial active uh, locations. And uh, we can only do so much in terms of the government inspected. We know that uh, we've asked for environmental guidance and on-site inspection for a number of uh, potential uh, areas that may not be com um, compliant. But we're really depending on the public um, to, to assist with the enforcement of these measures. So if you go to a barber salon or you go to a, a beauty parlor, you should observe a certificate that they have participated and completed and have been successful with, uh, with the infection control training. 
when you see clusters and gatherings of many people you know, uh, say on the back of a truck, it's 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 our responsibility to say, um, come come now, let's do something different with this. In terms of the penalties, I'm sorry, I'm not able to address that. Altenese running. Good afternoon, ma'am. My question is, since there are some regulations now that have been relaxed for exercising, what is the difference between exercising and uh, relax relaxing regulations to go to the beach here in um, the Providence this year and indicate why health officials have not recommended to the competent authority that beaches can open in the islands that they're not being allowed to open on? Dr. Brennan, do you want to take a stab at that? <laughs> He's the exercise guru. Uh, sure. Good afternoon. Um, I think what we can assure ourselves of when it comes to exercising is what we are asking is that persons do so in either in really small groups or as individuals. So the prime minister said you can do so with your families or you can do as individuals. But once you start moving toward opening up beaches and saying that people can go to beaches, that no longer becomes an individual or a small family activity. It then becomes a group activity. And so even if your small group um, is on the beach, then you may have other small groups that you come into contact with. And it'd be very difficult to be able to claim a spot and then asking people to then social distance because you just don't have the level of authority and regulation for each person to tell each other that we are going to space out in that way. So so if you keep beaches and parks closed for now, um, then you can allow us to get into a mode where we're able to get out of the house, we're able to do exercise and do things in small groups without necessarily threatening that social distancing that will come once you start opening beaches. Thanks. Jasper Ward. I didn't ask my second question. I have a second question now. Yes, you may. Can I ask my second question, please? Yes, you may. Thank you. The Prime Minister just announced that the government quarantine facility will be deactivated tomorrow. Can you confirm if there are any patients left inside the government quarantine facility and what will happen to them if there are any? Yes, there are a number left or remaining there. Uh, come, Dr. Brett. Yes, the absolute. Uh, it, the number is changing. So just be, uh, be understanding that the figures he gives you may not be the figures as of 6 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, good afternoon again. Um, so this morning we started out with 86 individuals in our quarantine facilities. Um, we had an exercise about two weeks ago when we brought individuals into country um, and they were repatriated. And so now that they finished their two weeks, we were allowed to have about 20 of them leave. And then in two more days, we'll have another 20 or so leave at that time. Um, that was the prediction. Um, but now that we are relaxing some of those quarantine uh, regulations, we'll be able to allow people to leave maybe a day or so earlier. Um, we do understand at the same time that with this change, you know, some people will not have already have made their arrangements for them to be able to either go home, um, whether they're on a different family island or, you know, their families are going to be able to receive them um, in the next 24 hours. Um, so it'll still be a process to get people out of the facility and moving back into their regular abode um, or into even a different living situation. So it'll be a process to get us there. Um, but the people have been told that this is going to happen. So we will move slowly toward that. We anticipate that the final closure will be in a week's time. Um, Jasper Ward, please. Uh, good evening. My question is for the Prime Minister. Um, I wanted to know if you can, well, I just wanted to know, why did you accept the resignation of um, Dr. Dwayne Sands as Minister of Health during um, a global health crisis? Um, and can you explain exactly what the breaching protocol was that happened and why other individuals such as aviation minister Dino Isiodiagli would have admitted to being involved in the um, allowings of uh, the seven, six Americans to return to the Bahamas. Why wasn't he also reprimanded uh, for his involvement? In that Thank issue? you very much, Jasper. 
Dr. Duran Sands submitted his letter of resignation publicly, of which you would be very much aware of. This matter has been discussed and debated extensively um, in the public domain. And at this particular point in time, we are more concerned um, with dealing with the COVID pandemic, getting our economy running again, ensuring that people uh, get their jobs back, ensuring that people have um, food on their table, and we um, um, decreased our unemployment, or increased our employment status that we see today. And um, I do wish him well in his, um, in his private sector role. Thank you. My second question now? Yes, you may. Although I, I didn't feel like you said exactly why you accepted his resignation, Mr. Prime Minister, I will move on to my other question. Um, can you say whether returning citizens or residents will have to be tested for COVID-19 um, now that they're no longer required to go into facilities upon arrival to the Bahamas? The policy is residents are still required to um, obtain a COVID negative test. And um, as you know, that would have been um, spoken to also by the um, Minister of Tourism. And he spoke about what would happen with the yachts and um, private aircrafts coming in. So the answer to that question is yes, that, that is still required. OK, thank you. Leandro Rome. Good afternoon. Um, you had mentioned that surveillance t for surveillance teams will be ramped up in light of concerns about cases increasing in the country. Um, how prepared are we in terms of isolation tubes in the event that we that cases are found on the family islands? I know that it was mentioned that I think um, find if there's there had been a challenge with finding isolation tubes in larger sizes. So, um, can you speak to that? Um, yes, the. Uh, PIUs, the patient transport uh, unit, isolation units, um, we have adequate numbers of them and the sizes we now have in, in country, the appropriate sizes uh, to transport individuals who are COVID suspect uh, into New Providence. In terms of heightened surveillance uh, in the family islands, um, again, as we change protocols, uh, for for monitoring, uh, for identification of of, of, of possible uh, COVID cases, our teams have increased in numbers, um, particularly in the family islands. Um, I'll ask Dr. Gillian Bartlett to speak to that, please. Good afternoon, Bahamas. Yes, the family islands have been well equipped uh, with the local healthcare team on the grounds. That's in from the north to the very south, from Abaco in the north to Inago in the south. They have been alerted to the change in the protocol, so they are on heightened surveillance to detect those persons that may be suggestive of having COVID symptoms. And once they are brought to the detention of the local healthcare team, they will be assessed, swabbed if necessary, transported into New Providence if they have to come into a hospital setting, isolated on the island if necessary, so that they can be assessed. So all the islands and all the healthcare teams are on alert and we are prepared to deal with the situation should it arise on any one of our family islands. Thank you. My next question is for the Prime Minister. Um, the Prime Minister spoke about the Economic Committee that it's still working on its plans. And we know that when um, he was in opposition, he threw his support behind nonpart a nonpartisan national development plan. Considering the need right now for quick and decisive actions to improve our economy, why create a new economic committee that will that is still working on its plans when the de national development plan is there with economic solutions that can be implemented quickly? Thank you very much for your question. I must say that the Economic Committee um, and um, the Office of the Prime Minister, we do um, take into consideration what has been put forth in the National Economic Plan. But as you know, um, the world is changing, and therefore one has always come forth with new ideas. I just want to expand on, on, on um, 
Jasper's question earlier so as to clarify a particular point because I note that the leader of the opposition had made some statement that there was discriminatory practice that we were allowing um, non-residents in um, not requiring testing and Bahamians requiring testing. That is false. Both require a code COVID testing. If you're talking about up to July 1st, we've not, we've not um, thought that far yet, but um, as far as we're concerned at this particular time, and even when the Minister of Tourism spoke, those individuals that he spoke about require testing, and all require all coming traveling home require testing also. Up to July 1st, we cannot speak to that at this particular time, as this is um, very fluid. Thank you. Karen Bain. Good afternoon. I'm Karen Bain from the Global 99.5 FM. Knowing that there are symptomatic carriers, and as we quickly get ready for the return of inter-island travel, what was the defining force behind eliminating the need for individual testing for our domestic travel market? Uh, thank you. You referred to symptomatic, but I think you intended asymptomatic carriers, correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, when we look at the incubation period, the behavior of the virus, um, although it is ever-changing, we do have uh, patterns of incubation of the virus, the length of in incubation of the virus, and we go through different cycles of the incubation period. But I'm going to invite Dr. Forbes to speak to you as to the low risk, the lowered risk to um, domestic travel, given that many of our islands did not have exposure to COVID over an extended period of eight weeks. Dr. Forbes? Good afternoon. Thank you for the question. So as it relates to testing for COVID before domestic travel, that is somewhat controversial. We have to understand that a COVID test actually is only good for the first, for the day that you're doing the test, especially as it relates to people who may be asymptomatic. Quite simply put, if you test someone today, they have no symptoms, it can't guarantee that, that they won't test positive tomorrow or that they will test positive at all. So what we have to do is to try and consider how we can travel safely. That being said, persons should continue the public health mechanisms that we have put into place. They should wear masks when in public, try to prevent crowded situations, and certainly monitor yourself for symptoms. That is going to get very important as we see an increase in travel. People should monitor themselves for symptoms after travel, and we will have mechanisms in place whereby people can report whether they're having symptoms so that we can isolate and put in place measures early. So testing, quite simply, is not 100% foolproof. Do you have a second question? Yes, I do. My second question is for the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. Sir, on the minds of Grand Bahamians is in the midst of this pandemic and the start of the hurricane season, is why the plans for a new hospital was changed. For the past eight months, Grand Bahamians have not had a fully functioning hospital that can accommodate the residents' needs. A new state-of-the-art hospital was something that Grand Bahamians have clamored for for a number of years. Can we get a defined directive as to why the plans were scrapped for the new Grand Bahama Hospital? Thank you very much for your question. Plans have not scra been scratched. As you know, a new hospital would, ta would take at least three years to build, and things must happen within that three years. So it's essential that we renovate and um, continue to utilize the services of the Rand Hospital until we can build a new hospital. And um, that carries a certain cost now, but the immediate um, needs right now is for Grand Bahama to have a functional hospital. And to be functional, you must repair and service what we have now. New hospital takes three years. Thank you. Ava Turnquest, please. Good afternoon. Uh, 
Dr. Menes, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, my question. I wanted to piggyback off of uh, Jasper's question. I know you said we're focused on the COVID-19 fight, but perhaps um, if you can just uh, uh, answer uh, one of her questions, which was, what was the exact breach that Dr. Sands made for which he was um, uh, made to, or which he has submitted his... Uh, if allow me to repeat, that matter was discussed at, at, for, at infinitum in the press. So that matter is finished. Okay, we are moving on, trying to get our economy running, trying to deal with this pandemic, get people out functioning, working, and have food for their family and themselves. That is our priority today. Thank you. Perhaps a bit of context. That this is the first time we will be speaking to you since April 19th. Now, during a pandemic, obviously, we're clamoring uh, for some face time with you. Are you are you still the um, acting Minister of Health, or have you have you assumed responsibility for that portfolio? Yes, I am still the acting uh, Minister of Health, and um, I would remain there at least until after the budget. I think it would be unfair for me to name a new minister at this particular time and um, he or she be placed in a position where they would have to present the health budget to the nation. Um, I think it would be appropriate that I'm here at this particular time that I should um, deliver the health budget to the nation, after which I would then um, appoint a new Minister of Health um, um, soon after um, I deliver the budget. Tyler Sibonet. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, all, and good afternoon, Bahamas. Um, my first question is related to the opening up of our borders on completely on July 1st. Is there a contingency plan for if we face an influx of imported cases? What will happen if there is a case of tourists who have already entered the country if they test positive for COVID-19? What I can say is that we would continue our surveillance program. We would continue to monitor situations and try to minimize any um, introduction of COVID. But in the meantime, we are strengthening our infrastructure so that in the event we're faced with any um, COVID disorder, we would be able to deal with it appropriately. So our infrastructure in terms of the hospital, other health facilities are being strengthened and prepared just in the event that should happen. Okay, thank you for that answer. And for my second question, in a press conference last week, the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Peter Turnquist, stated that the government will not meddle between the landlord and tenant relationship. However, even with the rental assistance program going on, there are still many cases of landlord evicting tenants. And even though payments have been deferred, tenants will still have to foot the bill after being without employment for quite some time now. Will this program be revisited? I have heard and received numerous complaints of um, what you speak of, and I am in active discussion with my Attorney General as to how we can deal with this matter. Thank you. <laughs> Jamie Smith, please. Good afternoon. It was mentioned earlier that there are 86 persons still in quarantine. Of that number, are there any here in Grandmama. Um, can I ask Dr. Frank Bartlett to speak to that, please? Dr. Bartlett. Good evening. The numbers that you would have mentioned or would have been mentioned earlier uh, in respect to NASA figures. Our figures of persons in quarantine here in Grand Bahama is 101. Of those, we would have some 60 that are travel related. Um, the persons that are travel related for the greater part would have returned in our repatriation exercise on May 23rd. Um, as of tomorrow, they would have completed their 14 days of quarantine and our numbers would only be representative of persons who would have been under investigation um, for COVID-19. Of all the tests that we would have sent so far for those persons under investigations, there are some three that we have to send off to get results back. And all of the persons we would have had under investigation from 30 days ago, the test results have been negative. Thank you. 
Thank you. One more question for you, doctor. Is contact, contact tracing still ongoing here on the island of Guamama? Contact tracing is ongoing. Um, and contact tracing basically involves identification first of a case that is positive. Um, now, when we have persons that are under investigations, we do an initial evaluation as to as it relates to possibilities of having persons they may have come in contact with. But in the absence of us having any type of case in the last 29 days, then there is no active contact tracing going on. Those persons who are in quarantine are um, monitored. Um, and they call every single day, telephone calls, and the indications where we may have to visit somebody or some other issue arise, then home visit is made in that instance. Elizabeth Bryan, please. Oh, yes, good evening. This question is directed towards Prime Minister Minnis. With each of the islands of the Bahamas having their own unique set of challenges, is the Economic Recovery Committee crafting a recovery strategy specifically tailored to each of the islands, in addition to its industry or sector focus, and what ways? Let's use Alutra as an example. Thank you. As you know, your question would have been addressed in the national um, plan. And yes, they are looking at what you um, stated. Um, I would not want to expand at this particular time because um, we're going into budget debate commencing Monday and um, both myself and the Minister of Finance would elaborate on those matters. So I would not want to preempt him, nor would I want to preempt myself what I'd be discussing at that particular time. Is there any other question? Thank you kindly. Uh, I did have a second question, but we did answer that earlier, which was to do with tourists being required to have COVID-19 tests. So thank you kindly. Ladidro Marsh, please. Hi, good afternoon. Ladidro Marsh from the Compass in Grand Bahama. I wanted to ask about the beaches and the parks that are being opened um, in Lucera and Harbor Island and Exuma and San Salvador. How we uh, have there been any mass testing or adequate testing for COVID-19 for this to have happened? And are we at all concerned about any um, any cases um, happening once these parks and beaches are open? As you would have heard from Dr. Bartlett, we have an active monitoring system by the local health teams. We also have reports that come in uh, on the behavior and the, and, the, and the number of movements of people uh, in each of the islands. Um, you would have heard that um, Eleuthera has not had a case, um, the full extent of Eleuthera, and um, neither has Spanish Wells nor Harbor Island. And given that we've gone through these incubation periods with close observation and surveillance, uh, it was felt that they should not be denied going on the beaches with the same practices that they have demonstrated during these past eight weeks. Okay, thank you. Uh, we know that these hair salons and the barber shops are being required to take and have a certification from the Ministry of Health um, before they reopen. Uh, what safety measures are put in place or any protocols have there been put in place to protect the customs and the immigration officers um, at the air and sea borders uh, because they are the first line of contact? Good. Now let's talk to Mike Mullen to answer that question. Good afternoon, and thank you for your question. Uh, early on in the, out, well, when we were dealing with just China, or if many of you re would recall, we, uh, we worked closely with our border control officers, i.e. Customs and Immigration. And um, from that time, we began installing uh, the plexiglass uh, at the immigration uh, area, in the immigration area, particularly at LBIA. And we would have also put in place um, an algorithm where they work closely with uh, port surveillance officers uh, to 
ensure that, you know, should they have any concerns, they will actually notify us. But we also, we provide them with PPEs and other measures um, from the beginning of this uh, our pandemic. It wasn't a pandemic back then, but this has been ongoing. And we continue to, uh, you know, require that they also uh, use the mask and use the other measures that we have implemented for the general public. So we have been working closely with them and we will continue to work closely with those officers. Shimako Lightwood. Good afternoon, Dr. Dal Regis, uh, to our panel of health officials here today. Um, in our, we had a press conference on Tuesday with the Ministry of Tourism, who did um, explain to us that the marketing strategy would be geared um, to remote family islands to the out islands. Um, so I did want to know if there were plans to provide family islands with the gear needed to test cases on the island, if only to expedite the lab testing that needs to be done in the capital. So I guess I'm asking really for a tangible number of test kits. Good afternoon again. And yes, as a part of our surveillance efforts and a part of the change in protocol, we are ensuring that all family islands are equipped with the swabs necessary to do the testing of all suspected cases of COVID-19. Thank you. Do you have a second question? Yes, Dr. Regis. Um, and just a follow-up, very close to that one. So looking at what some countries have done with cruise ships, um, is there a possibility of a coordinated effort, say perhaps between the defense force officers and healthcare officers, to do a screening of boaters coming into the ports on the family islands? I'd ask Dr. McMillan to answer that, please. Good afternoon again. Um, certainly, port surveillance has is an integral part of what we do on a regular basis. Um, uh, we have one of the largest uh, cruise ship arrivals in the Caribbean. So we have it put in place a port surveillance mechanism, which includes, um, you know, monitoring the, 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 the declaration of health, maritime declaration of health, particularly with the cruise ships. But as it relates to the marinas and the pleasure vessels, we are seeking to strengthen the relationship with our marina association and we're putting in additional protocols to be able to monitor the the the, the pleasure vessels as they move through our country um, and uh, we anticipate that we will have very good uh, a very good response from the association uh, that deals with the marinas and we will also continue to monitor they are putting in place actually uh, an electronic mechanism to be able to receive all the documents that's required so we anticipate that we will be doing, uh, you know, uh, enhanced monitoring in that area. Uh, Jerome Sawyer, my apologies. I think you are to ask another question. Yes, thank you for allowing me the opportunity. My second question um, goes to the Prime Minister. Um, as we move towards the opening of borders scheduled for July 1st. This is borders for international travel. Um, throughout the United States, particularly in some major cities um, and states across the states, uh, we see an increase or resurgence, pardon me, in COVID-19 cases. Add to that the recent protests that have been happening across the United States. And if you look at those protests, many of those individuals are without masks and there's no social distancing and health officials are already concerned that that could lead to um, even more of a resurgence in cases. If we are still moving towards this July 1st opening of international borders, um, how do you justify to Bahamians, uh, particularly those who will be working on the front lines of tourism, uh, that, or how do you justify to them what's going to happen? How are they going to be made safe? Um, and in particular, the issue of having Bahamians continue to wear masks, but make it optional uh, for tourists when they come. Many have seen it as discriminatory. Uh, how do you justify those things given what's happening um, in our largest tourist market and we're moving towards opening borders in July? 
Yes, thank you, Jerome. What's happening in the United States, we are monitoring and observing very closely. Um, we have not yet um, established nor put together a protocol with, re with respect to the 1st of July. As I have said earlier, this entire situation is very fluid, and um, we're working continuously as to um, inclusive of reviewing other protocols or other procedures that are done throughout the world. And um, they, too, are monitoring other situations to make determination. And um, we're reviewing and monitoring and would make a definitive determination as to what protocol we would have to put in place. But what I can assure you, there will be no discrimination in terms of whatever protocol are put in place. But we would do all that is possible to ensure that each and every Bahamian within our jurisdiction and boundaries are safe. I'd like to thank each of you for your thoughtful questions and uh, ask you to enjoy the holiday and be safe. Thank you.